This is Dr. Robert Greenberg, and welcome to the Break It Down Show. I'm in, uh, I'm in the escape. John's about to pop in. He's right next to me here, but he's on his own little workstation, and we're doing this remote and live. This is so much fun. This is Dr. Bob. If you guys don't know Dr. Bob, well, uh, you're, about, you're about to get to know him. He is one of the most important people uh, that we've met along the way. Dr. Bob, we're coming up on 1,300 episodes. Oh, my and, God. And from day one, I mean, you've yeah, been so one of the big people in our lives, and it's just so incredible to have you here still all these years later. And of course, I have to acknowledge, you know, it seems like every time someone major in our family dies, we get together and we sort of sort it out on the show. And I thought we might also look, my brother, Eric, died. we're going to bury him tomorrow and have a party oh, for yeah. him on Saturday. Yeah. And, you know, we got to talk about that. But we got a lot of other exciting, good music things to talk about. I'm going to shut up and let John and you guys talk for a little bit. So thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure, as always. I'm just sorry we can't be doing it live. Yeah. Well, that's nothing to be sorry about. I mean, we're doing what we can and we're doing what we can to stay safe. And I'm just happy to see your your beautiful face, Dr. Bob. You know, John, you got more hair on your head right now, dude, <laughs> than I've ever had at any part of my body cumulatively my entire life. I am uh, so impressed. I saw a photo of you from uh, back in New Jersey where yeah. I don't know if we have that photo to bring up for the audience, but it's uh, I, I beg to differ. I think uh, Pete said, hey, I got something I got to show you. And he showed me this photo of you. And I looked and I thought, now there's a guy who got lucky in an El Camino. <laughs> yeah, but I, don't, I didn't need it then. I need it now. What can I tell you? I see. I see. Well, um, first things first, I want to show our audience around the escape. This, uh, this is my drum set. And uh, this is where we practice. So uh, the band that that we um, that we rehearse in this place of many bands that rehearse in this place is called Uncommon Wealth, and we're a British rock band because our singer uh, Andy Brunt is from London, and his son is our keyboard player Ruben Brunt, and he's also English. So we thought, you know, it'd be a great shtick. Uh, let's just play all the British tunes that we know in common, and then it turned into, yeah, but you know why wouldn't we take advantage of uh, the British um, tradition of uh, colonizing and play our favorite tunes from everywhere that was a Commonwealth? So uh, the band's called Uncommonwealth and everybody come out and see us. We'll be back in the spring. We took the uh, winter off so that the boys could go back to London and visit family, but uh, we'll be back in the swing of things in the spring. And I hope that we're playing all over the place, including in Oakland. And when things calm down COVID wise and we're playing outside, we uh, we definitely want to have you come check us out, maybe sit in. Sounds fun. Yeah. What are you up to nowadays? Uh, that's a really good question. That that's, Oh, my goodness. Well, there's my grad, my college graduation picture. Yeah. Oh my! With that that fake mustache that eventually, eventually, after about ten years, started looking like a real mustache, and then, <laughs> at the age of forty nine, this was way long ago, but about three months before I turned fifty, I looked in the mirror. Not only was the mustache gray, but my nose hairs, my gray nose hairs, were actually growing into the mustache. You couldn't tell the difference. That was that was the signal to me to remove the mustache originally grown to make myself look older. Uh, I already looked old enough. Thank you very much. So bye-bye. <laughs> what am I doing these days? I'm, I'm writing for this uh, subscription platform called Patreon. Well, I'm hang writing. on a minute. We'll get back to your Patreon page okay. in a second, but can you substantiate the rumor that you did or did not get lucky in an El Camino with that haircut and mustache? I never got, I, I never got lucky in an El Camino. Uh. You know, I didn't even get lucky in a Volkswagen bus, and everyone got lucky in a Volkswagen bus. <laughs> no, a 57 Ford. That's what I can claim. Okay. That was my car. That was my car. It wasn't a, it wasn't a fair lane. It was just a Ford. And um, that was my drive-in car. So, yes. But unfortunately, I can make no claims on a Camino. Hot that those that they were. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the thing about the El Camino was that it gave you choices, of course, because you had the uh, the back the or bed. the seat. Right. That's right. But you also, if if it, you know, in inclement weather, you could make something happen in the uh, confines of the of the very small cab. But, well, but uh, the cab had a bench. Yeah. It didn't have bucket seats. It had a bench. 
Yeah. So, you know, you could stretch out one way or the other. This is going way beyond where I'm prepared to go, though. So let, let's get back to better topics. <laughs> yes. Your Patreon page. Well, I'll, I'll just share it with everyone now. But you asked me what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, I'd be out concertizing right now if this was anywhere near a pre-2020 year. But uh, all my gigs have been canceled for the last two years. And mm. so I've just been spending all my time blogging and vlogging and performing and Zooming and bloviating on a subscription site. And, and I'm posting five days a week, all kinds of material, jazz, rock and roll, concert music, and sometimes non-music at all. I've been go doing a slow tour through my cocktail shaker collection, yes, and uh, which is fun. You know, I pick a theme of... Uh, airplane cocktail shakers and i'll do a whole show on cocktail shakers shaped like airplanes or like bells or like rockets or whatever and that validates the uh, the addiction i've had in buying all these things over the years yeah and so so it's it's fun i got about i got about 625 uh patrons and they're very active and in interacting with me and uh, we do zooms together so that has gotten me through the pandemic i have to say that's been the contact that otherwise i didn't have and haven't had with audiences. And that's been the most important thing, to tell you the truth. It's not even about money. For me, it's just been about feeling that I'm still part of a community, part of part of a world. Fantastic. Can, I, can, can we shake things up a little bit here? I want to um, I want to bring in somebody I think you're going to be interested in talking to. So I'm going to let John do the intro, but here comes uh, someone special. Go ahead, John. You introduce and I'll bring her in. All right. Well, and, uh, episode 24, I think, um, we had the good fortune of meeting um, somebody who musically means a lot to all of us, a guy named Mick Gillette. And uh, my dear friend Jason Stewart was in the Mick Gillette band. Um, at the time, Mick's uh, musical co-conspirator uh, was his daughter, Megan. And so we did um, an episode with Mick where it started off with Hey, uh, I don't know what I'm going to talk about for an hour. And of course, it was Mick Gillette. So by the time we were done, it was a two parter and uh, it was to, mo to promote what at the time was their album, um, which was called Turn Two. And uh, hey, Megan. Hey, hi, guys. Megan How are you? So Hello. Megan is a, a brilliant singer and a, just a, uh, a wonderful human being we, we know and love. And uh, Dr. Bob, I say the same about you, except for the singing. You're, you're a piano player, but we know and love you. And so we wanted to put the two of you together because you ought to know each other. Megan, it is so wonderful to meet you. You know, I've been, I've been listening to you oh. from, from afar in this room um, a lot over the last two weeks. Because I, 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 I wrote a big article about your dad because, you know, the anniversary of his death is coming up on Monday. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, I mean, everyone you talk to, he's still a legend in the Bay Area. Right. And yeah. um, and I know the guys knew him and I never had the chance to meet him. So I wanted to I wanted to know him better and uh, and and write about him. And what a great character. What a fun right. person. You know, I oh, have yeah. to say some of the some of the stuff I love the most were the various videos of him playing the Star Spangled Banner. For the giants because more yeah. often than not he took his students with him yes you know it yeah. was it was all about the kids always and, and he did an arrangement for four trumpets and first for the first whatever it is 16 bars one trumpet then the next 16 bars two trumpets then three trumpets he would yeah. only come in at the very end because it wasn't about him it was about giving the showcase to the kids it was and it just you don't see that at that level of musicianship very often. You just don't. No, you know what? I think you're you're absolutely correct. And I was doing uh, I was I was doing my homework and I was checking you out and hearing you know you were you were brought up with your grandma and and you know that it it's it's deep rooted when it comes from you know la familia. It's hard to it's hard to ignore it. And I think that it's really important that the people that do get it from that young age, you know, in the womb. That they're the ones that that keep the passion alive mm -hmm. for it, you know, for the people that, that didn't get provided that opportunity, that maybe didn't have instruments in the city and didn't have, you know, a chance to learn something if they really felt it. And, you know, I think that it's it's the job of those people that feel it, like yourself, to keep it keep it alive and pass that baton and 
And most importantly, that that was what he wanted to do was pass the baton. So right. Right. That, and that's what I hear the most, too. It's really great. You know, I see his kids doing well, which is what he wanted. And he has so many right. kids all over the place just doing great right. things. And I'm friends. You know, I, I follow them on Instagram or, you know, whatever things they're doing now. And it just warms my heart because it keeps him alive for me and for his grandchildren. You know, so, it's it's so interesting. As musicians, we all want to excel and mm -hmm. we all. OK, I, I prefer fortune over fame. But having neither, you know, you just got to speculate. <laughs> but really, in the end, you're remembered for the good works you do, not yeah. for how you played, not for what you wrote. Because once you're gone, that stuff tends to go fast. But it's human memory. It's, it's the human touch, you know, the, the acts of a teacher, the acts of a parent that are remembered and that truly last because they get handed down generation after generation after generation. And what I saw with your dad and what I've seen with other great teachers and cool parents too, can you validate kids who are otherwise feeling insecure and inadequate? Because by our very nature, we're insecure and inadequate. I mean, adults too, bless us. But if someone in a position of, of ability and expertise can say to a kid, good job, that was fine. That creates a, a sense of, I don't want to say self-esteem because it's too cheap a phrase. It creates a sense of spirit and, and energy and I'm okayness. Mm -hmm. You never know where that ends. You never know that's where true. that's going to end. And yeah, that's so cool, man. So when I, when I saw him doing those and 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 the other stuff with with amateur musicians and it's just that's really cool right and you know what's really cool is like when i get these videos i actually can i can totally sense his spirit i can feel him there he was just larger than life so mm -hmm. you know it's it's nice i am just so grateful to have these videos and these moments and Right. And the time that I got to spend on stage with him, you know, and I never felt like I was worthy. I'm like, come on, man, he's a beast. But he, I, I just, he made I wanna, he tried to make everyone feel worthy. <laughs> I want to jump in real quick here and just say because we're talking about Mick Gillette, just for anybody who doesn't know. And if you still don't know who Mick Gillette is, let me just say this. Anytime we encounter a horn player on the show and we say, Well, we've had Mick Gillette on, they stop in their tracks. I'm not <laughs> exaggerating. And they go, he's the legend. And so if you're, if you're wondering, like, who's Mick Gillette, he is the people <laughs> that other horn players stop what they're doing and they readjust their attitude and they just start to praise what your dad did. And this is what Dr. Bob is going to capture. I mean, his impact on music is it's not just like, the kids, of course. I mean, we don't want to talk about that, but his peers are literally I'm, I just I can't say this. And I know John will echo this is I turned his mic on, but. It's incredible to see over and over and over again, people just saying, wow, Mick Gillette. And, and then of course the personality is, is enormous. Okay, I'm gonna bring John in. <laughs> I'll add to that is that half the time we hear, oh, Mick, yeah, he was the legend. He was a, a big influence. The other half the time we hear, he was my teacher. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Given the spread, I mean, he started it. He started them in middle school, right? I mean, yeah. he was, yeah. he was Stanley Middle School and Lafayette yep. and, and all yep. and Walnut Creek and, and then all the way up through. Through New York, all this stuff. He went he went everywhere, man. He raised he a everywhere. lot of money for a lot of schools. One of, the, one of the quotes I read that I enjoyed the most was, I don't remember whose quote it was, and I'm not using it on in my piece, but this was some professional horn player who was sitting front row of uh, during one of the, uh, I guess it was the, the second time around with Tower of Power between what, 2009 and 2011. Mm -hmm. And, you know, your dad would hold his trumpet in his right hand. He'd hold <laughs> his trombone in his left hand and he'd just boom, 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 go back and forth like it was one yeah. instrument, you know, playing this <laughs> almost virtually the same note. Well, that's, mm -hmm. should, that's almost physically impossible because the embouchure is completely different. The mouthpiece mm -hmm. is completely different. The air column is completely different. Uh, you're not supposed to be able to do stuff like that. That's like Swami <laughs> stuff, you know? That's like that's like circular breathing playing a didgeridoo stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and so what this what this player said was just kept watching go back and forth, trumpet, trombone, trumpet, trombone, trumpet, trombone. And just had to turn away and stop looking. Because this the person said, This is this, this is this is stupid. This <laughs> and, and he did it, he did it so casually, you know? Yeah. 
you know, casually, like that's just one of the things he did. And that's always with elite musicians. You know, I'm, I'm most of the time talking about elite piano players because that's what <laughs> I do. And an elite piano player is, is not a normal human being. I mean, an elite piano player has as much to do with a normal human being as an, Olymp as an Olympic gymnast has to do with my body. You know, <laughs> excuse me. That's, that's a different level of homo sapien. That's, that's <laughs> nothing I can even contemplate. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, he was like the Simone Biles of, of brass and, and that's what elite players can do. They do stuff. The rest of us can't quite fathom. We right. should say for listeners who just popped in, um, we're on with Dr. Bob Greenberg, of course. And then we sprung on him a surprise, uh, with Megan Gillette. We're talking about Megan's dad, Mick Gillette, who was, a uh, yeah, he was a legendary force in music and, and on, uh, the trumpet and trombone, and as an arranger, and as a, a, a spot arranger, a, a horn arrangement writer. Um, but you talk about how he was switching back and forth between the instruments, and I think what happens when we witness that kind of greatness is that those two things um, cease to be the instrument. He was the instrument. And when somebody can cross that line is, is when we talk about them with this, this much love and reverence. Um, you know, with, uh, with regard to the piece that you have coming up, I just, again, if you just join the show, um, Dr. Bob, uh, you can see his Patreon link at the bottom there and, uh, and you should join the community. It's, it's, um, he's doing wonderful things. He's posting five times a week. It's a music education that you wouldn't be able to get uh, in a single place anywhere else except if you, you know, dedicated your life to music education. And a lot of people who love music don't have that kind of time and that kind of resource anymore. So you offer a unique thing for all of us who love music, and that is the ability to go to a single source and, and um, have a cultivated journey where you're mining the best information from music through from antiquity all the way to uh, contemporary styles and you know all the greatness from all the years and it should be fun yeah you know mm -hmm. what you know whatever the topic is especially music you know how many of, how often have i heard it and way too often oh you make this so much fun i said how can it not be fun i mean it's like food and wine if if food and wine are not fun Something's severely wrong with your life, for goodness sake. That's right. You don't <laughs> and, work uh, music, you play music. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, studying music, being exposed to a wide variety of different kinds of music, I mean, this is about as life-enhancing life a thing as I can think of. And so that's, that's the other thing about what I've always tried to do, as you guys know, is, is take the stuffing out of it, uh, or the stuffiness, I should say, and make sure that we relate to Mozart the same way we relate to Tower of Power, because it's the same darn thing. It's people making music for other people, communicating in this wonderful language that by lacking words has no real meaning except what we feel in our guts. And the key to it all, as you've heard me say, and then I'll stop babbling, but the key to it all is realizing nothing is out of date. Everything is contemporary. Every piece of music that exists was new music at one time and represented something important of its time and place. And as long as we accept that, and that the musicians are all human beings like we are, then all music is applicable to all people. And I, I believe that to be true. So for example, I'm doing, um, I'll be talking about Mick Gillette on the 17th. Then I use that as a, as a hook, because on the 18th, I have a column that's called uh, Dr. Bob Prescribes. And by the way, I'm gonna apologize to everyone up front, this Dr. Bob shit, pardon, uh, my students started calling me Dr. Bob when I taught at the San Francisco Conservatory because I was maybe 10 years older than they were. And yes, I had a PhD, but calling me Dr. Greenberg sounded ridiculous and calling me professor sounded even stupider. And I come from a very tough neighborhood in Southern New Jersey where too much arrogance gets you hit. And so they just started calling me Dr. Bob and it stuck. That was 40 years ago, for goodness sake. Well, Pete and I started calling you Dr. Bob because we, we began with Dr. Greenberg, but then you got us a little bit hammered and, and we couldn't get out that many syllables. Right. So right. as much as we could shorten it, that helped out. 
<laughs> well, you know, and that's what I do. That's the hammer part, right? Yeah. Right. A good martini will go a long way. But anyway, back this Dr. Bob prescribes post on Tuesday. So I used Maestro Gillette as a as a pivot. And then on Tuesday, the post will be uh, about a guy named um, a, the former first chair trumpet player at the San Francisco Symphony, Mark Lawrence. And he made a recording called Trombonology, which is just, you can't believe the playing on this recording. And it, it, it's 18th century music, 19th century music, 20th century music. And Trombonology is actually a piece by Tommy Dorsey for trombone. And it's just an awesome drop dead recording with one of my favorite piano players of all time accompanying him a guy named Robin Sutherland, who tragically just died about a year ago. And, um, and so that's how I kind of do things. I try to, uh, try to follow one idea with another idea. So, so we're constantly kind of changing genre, uh, changing era, but connecting these, these, uh, these blogs, vlogs, and Zooms some way. So there you have it. Enough. Let's move on to greener topics. Okay. Well, greener topics, uh, this is a pretty green topic for us. So we're enjoying ourselves. And I just wanted to uh, punctuate that whether you're reading Music History Monday or Dr. Bob Prescribes or any of the content that's on your website, which is robertgreenbergmusic.com, uh, there's plenty of stuff on there and it goes all through the years and it's all written with the um, standpoint that music uh, should be a good time and always has been a good time. And, you know, those artists that it's neat that you point out that at some point, everything was contemporary. And one of the things that I've enjoyed about reading your stories is that you, um, reference the rock stardom that all of the people that we love, you know, musically uh, to include Mick, you know, the, they were the rock stars of whatever day their day was when they released that music and everybody had a journey that was interesting and fulfilling and neat to see. And, um, and you include those kind of details because a lot of times when we reach back to get the, get the goods from that music from a long time ago, we forget that a long time ago at, at one point was, you know, the day that that guy was famous. And in fact, it's not all that long ago. You know the game I play. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know my game. It wasn't that long ago. Three How lifetimes. many lifetimes ago? Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, my dad, my dad passed in 2017. And he was 92. He, he shouldn't have gotten past 45. I mean, given all the smoking and la I mean, he used to brag that, that he never exercised a day in his life after he left the Navy in 46. And his idea of exercise was what we called competition parking. And that was how close a parking spot could he get to where he was going. And he'd rather cruise around for half an hour than walk 50 yards from a further parking spot. That was, that was competition parking. That was his form of exercise. But uh, he lived 92 years. And the game that I play, right, is three times 92 is 276. And 276 years ago, it was, uh, it was 1746. That's just three life, three of my father's lifetimes ago, 1746. Um, Mozart won't be born for another 10 years <laughs> in 1746. Beethoven won't be born uh, 70 for another 24 years. Uh, you know, George Washington was 14 years old. And that's just three human lifetimes back to back, going, going back three of my dad's lifetime. So, you know, the, the main repertoire in the concert hall starts about 1750 with a few exceptions for Bach. <laughs> That's it. That's recent stuff. As far as I'm concerned, that's yesterday. Yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Hey, um, you know, we don't want to keep Megan all day because she's got uh, babies she's raising, but before you, before we let Megan go, uh, I just want to ask you real quick, Megan, are you, what are you working on anything besides raising babies? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wonder how that happens. Um, you know, I, at this point I'm teaching, um, I've been working with the little ones. It's kind of ingrained from watching my dad. So, um, I'm hoping that will continue. I'm also working on a children's book, which is based on my father 
and it is going to be uh, about a, a magical horn that takes you around the world, essentially. So hopefully in the next year or so, I can get that done. If I keep stop having babies, I guess, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in, in spite of your quest to popu repopulate the earth, you're getting a lot done. So, um, uh, hey, come back on with us and, and, uh, and be a guest on our show. Yes, I would love that. It's really nice to see your faces again. <laughs> Likewise. We have the same it's haircut. Nice to meet you. I know. I noticed that. You're getting, you're getting there, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Everybody, Megan Gillette. Thanks, Thank Megan. you, Megan. Nice Take to meet care. you, Dr. Bob. Great meeting you, too. All right. That was fun, huh? That was really nice of you guys. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, she's a sweetheart. And she and her dad were so intertwined in terms of like the way that they told stories, because, of course, he had a whole slew of stories before she came along. And then when she came along, um, you know, as she started to grow up, he thought, I'm missing my daughter's life. And that's when he left Tower um, for a while my, to raise her. Again, all I know is what I read. And I would have liked to have asked her this stuff just to confirm, because but what I read was, you know, he he became part of this group that became Tower of Power in 67. And, but he quit the road in 84, which was when she was born. I mean, mm -hmm. the year she was born, and I hate to age anybody, but I just, I remember this stuff. And, uh, and he supposedly, according to the literature, he, he started a landscaping company. Yeah. And, and ran a landscaping company uh, until, until finally, until she was, I think, 14, uh, until 98 and he decided okay it's time to it's time to get back into the music world yeah but that's again you, you don't you don't you don't see people who have their heads screwed on that well very often especially at the top of the business well the top of the business calls out to people who let's face it are fighting with uh, some kind of um you know something it, it calls you to that level right. of the game right. and usually when you do play at that level um you know you god how many artists have we had on who would talk about their achievements and you know we were on this tour and we were touring for two years and we went to 186 countries and then they stop for a moment and they go man i really paid for that with my family life or you know we had one guest who is a dear friend who in the middle of that story said you know something along those lines of i remember when we were making our way through europe and he took a breath and said sorry kids and then carried on with his story and it does you make a sacrifice for that and it was one that mick was not willing to make and it just shows in the way that you know, it showed in the way that he and his daughter loved each other. It shows in the way that she loves and nurtures her children. And uh, it was just terrific. You're right. It's not often that you see a guy who plays at that level, is a legend on his instrument, is a legend in, in you know, the shaping of popular music, who uh, has his head screwed on that way. This is a huge issue for all of us. You know, at some point in your life, early in your life, uh, if you end up as a professional musician, you realize you have, you have something. I don't want to get all too fancy and say a gift, but you have something. And then you develop it by cutting yourself off from a lot of stuff you could have done. You could have played with your friends more. You could have gone out with girls or men more. Uh, you could have enjoyed your life more, but you chose to give it to the instrument or to composing. And so that when you're an adult and you actually create a career in it, I think one of the things that goes through your mind constantly is if I don't keep pushing all the time, I become a fossil, I freeze, I'm dead, I'm replaced. And I think that's what so many people are, are you know, if, if there's a fear factor here, it's a fear of losing it, a fear of being replaced, a fear of being irrelevant, a fear of taking yourself out of the marketplace and by doing so, no longer being competitive. And it's all you are. You know, if you're a musician or a dancer or an athlete, you didn't take that up in your 20s, like an economist takes up economy, like a lawyer takes up law. You've been doing it since you were in single digits. You know, you've been doing it your whole life. Your whole self-image is wrapped up in yourself as a musician, as a dancer, as an athlete. And so, you know, I'm just, I'll tell you, I'm just glad I'm a musician because the dancers and the athletes do have to quit. Their bodies force them to quit. And 
my goodness, can you imagine a bigger crash than that crash that must take place in every one of them? Wow. Wow. But it's hard, it's hard to find that balance. It is between a family and this singular aspiration you've always had. I want to add to that, but I also want to um, start to close the, the book on, on Mick. So I want you to add this element in when you get a chance. You're the one guy we can ask. When you look at the pantheon of great musicians, you know, whoever it is, whatever, how, where does, I mean, look, we can, we can do all the lotting and everything we want, but, but you know who all the peers are in terms of Wagner and everybody else. And then the other thing about being in Tower of Power and those other bands of that era, you had done a lot of miles, even the miles that they did. You know, we've got guys in the show who are like, yeah, uh, you know, they told me they didn't do hard drugs. And then I got there and was like, oh, damn. <laughs> these guys right. like yeah. these guys really party. And so there's there's not only being gone, but the, the, the heaviness and the cost of of putting yourself on the edge of that. We had Ellie, um, Ali Willis on the show. And this is a third aspect of how hard this is. And Ali wrote all of the great songs. I mean, she could write anything. She had a contractual obligation. And so she just pushes out the theme song to friends who happen to be so many mm -hmm. artists like her or something like that. And so the, the new romantics were obligated to record a song. They're like, well, you're in town, so you're recording this, and it becomes their biggest hit. Yeah. No. Oh, re, re, yeah, whatever, new Rembrandt, Rembrandt, whatever it was, right? Yeah. And so there was a contractual thing. And, and Ali, once they realized she could write any song at any time, anywhere, on any topic, they just worked the hell out of her until she's like, I don't even like songwriting that much. Like, of course I can do it. But she wrote September. Would she rather write September or the theme song to Friends? And so you just – and you can't say no. You have to say yes Otherwise, you're no longer relevant. So talk about uh, who do you think uh, mixed peers were and and just uh, talk about those other two aspects of the, the hardness of the road miles and then also the hardness of the industry loving you so much they just milk you dry. I can't speak to where Mick stands only because I'm not a brass player and I'm not part of that subculture because it is a subculture. I mean, I know the horn players I listen to coming up. I mean, Lou Soloff, who was a lead trumpet player in Blood, Sweat and Tears. You know, I could go on with these different people, but I'm not part of that culture. You need to be part of that culture to have any sense of who's who. I could talk to you about contemporary composers and piano players, but that's as far as I would go. And even then, my ignorance is much greater than my knowledge because we all live in our skinny little world especially if we're practitioners. You know, you don't have time to do a lot of listening to everybody because you're so sucked into listening to yourself. And uh, so the people who are most knowledgeable about, about performers and such, for example, opera singers, it's the amateur opera fans who have forgotten more about singers than I'll ever know. And I'm a professional, but I'm sorry, they spend all their waking hours as hobbyists pursuing this passion of theirs. I don't have that kind of energy for that. And I don't have that kind of knowledge base that they do. So back to Mick, all I know is the guy was a monster musician with a great attitude. And everyone that you hear from says, this guy was special. And you can hear the specialness the moment you listen. I don't think I need to go beyond that at all as, as far as he goes. But as far as touring musicians and what it takes out of you, it bleeds you dry. Can you imagine? I'm just saying this to everybody. It looks so romantic. It sucks. Can you imagine being on the road for six or eight or nine months? You do a show, you pack up, you do another show, you pack up, you're in a hotel, a different hotel, six nights a week. If you're in a hotel. If you're in a hotel. Uh, you know, we all have travel snafus when we have to get on a plane, especially, God forbid, we have to get on a plane now. Can you imagine having to get on a plane five days a week and then sitting on a bus the other days of the week? No, it's a very hard job. And the, the prevalence of uh, non-prescription pharmaceuticals to help soften the blow, how could you not? It's almost, it seems to me, not doing that is almost a prescription for falling apart. Uh, I, I can't imagine that kind of life. To me, that's, it's, it's crazy. And it's a young man's game, a young woman's game, a young person's game. You get to a certain age, forget it. Just forget it. Beyond that, Pete, just, you know, I think we all just do the best we can and uh, try to find balance. But I think if you talk to any performing musician or for that matter, athlete or dancer, 
it's going to say the same thing on their tombstones. Tried to find balance, not successful. Yeah. Wow. You're in a uh, you're in a, a posh room there, filled with books that yeah. you can that you can reference as you do your research for keeping the rest of us entertained with um, with the history of of the music that we love. But um, as a composer, do you think that there is an edge to be had when you're in the midst of paying your dues that way? Um, whether you're a, a you know whether you're a composer of literate music or you're a composer of pop tunes. Uh, do you think that there is something for that young man's game that feeds into composition in, in the cycle of a composer's life? Do they need that at, at some point? Or could you put somebody in that library of yours and let them cultivate that gift there? Well, you know, but these books are for what I write. And I mm. have to say, you know, I, God bless me. I might be that last generation who, who depends on books. I like the, the tactile sense. I like touching stuff. You know, I'm, I mean, right now I'm writing, a, I'm writing a blog on a musician, a wonderful piano player named, named uh, Lenny Tristano, who was a jazz player. I studied with his principal student, a uh, sax player named Lee Konitz. But Lenny was a pianist, and what Lee taught me was how to listen, and that's what we all need to learn. Uh, I have three books on Lenny Tristano. None of this is on the web. None of this is out there. If I don't have these books, if I don't have a good library, I simply can't write. And since I'm not affiliated with the university and I don't have access to a huge music library, my, I'm only as good as my library. Mm. Now, back to what you ask about composers. I think, I, again, I'm not going to speak to songwriting, although I could. But if you want to write a string quartet, if we could wheel the camera around and you'd see where my scores are, if you don't know the repertoire, you can't write a string quartet. You know, you have to know what came before you and you have to know what's going on at your same time if you're going to have a, a, any kind of relevance to the community. And if you're a songwriter, it doesn't mean reading scores. It means listening to a billion songs. And it means probably playing the songs too. You know, just listening is not enough. I, I, I'm a firm believer that... Um, if you want to internalize music, you got to play it yourself, truly. You have to sing it. You have to play it. You have to somehow activate your own voice, your own soul, if you want to suck it in. Can we expect, you know, that's a real, you know, it's a good, it's an interesting question, isn't it? We have, um, we have athletic prodigies, uh, gymnasts and such that can do the most amazing things. We have musician prodigies who can play an instrument in an amazing way at a young, but we don't have creative prodigies. I mean, has a 12 year old ever written a great song? And I'm asking that rhetorically because I'm sure at some point it's happened, but it doesn't really. Has a 12 year old written a great novel, a great short story? No and no. They haven't lived long enough to know what emotions are all about, what life is all about. And they haven't lived long enough to absorb what they need to absorb in order to use it to make their own music. And so whomever you are, if this is what you're asking, John, I'm a firm believer that you have to know the repertoire. You have to know what's already been created. You have to know what's going on if you want to be relevant. And that's one of the very few advantages, it seems to me, of being a touring musician. You get to hear everything that's going on, you know, because when you're on tour, you're rubbing shoulders constantly with everybody else. And, and you're playing at all hours at all times. So at least you're living your music in a way that you wouldn't live it if you were simply back at home fooling around. Mm. But I, I, I don't think anyone who is creating can create in a vacuum. Well said. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, you know, it's maybe different because I'm a drummer, but I, there's definitely something to be said for being in playing shape and to be able to hold tempo for two hours, um, you know, to, to guide the band that way and to be able to listen that closely. Mm -hmm. And I think that to a, to a degree, there's some betrayal of that um, cultivation in the technology that we have nowadays where a guy can write a song and just cut, copy and paste 
And when you're able to do that, you lose the sense of sequence, you know, of a, of a song, or you maybe have a different sense of sequence for a song because you're not responsible for, for its flow all the way through. Um, I don't know. How much do you compose nowadays and how much would you, or do you at all use a computer to help you, um, arrange? Again, as my thinning hairline would betray, <laughs> um, I'm freaking aging, right? So I'm, I, I you're listening to an old fart now and not a youngster. Uh, I still compose at the piano. And early in the pandemic, I did a lot of writing, actually. That's kind of how I was keeping my head above water. Mm. A set of etudes for piano, a, a concerto for piano and strings, a piece for viola and piano. Um, nothing in the last six months, unfortunately. But to the point, I work everything out at the piano and in my head. Then, only then, do I upload the music using a program called Finale, hmm. uh, which is originally a software uh, notational program that allows you to notate beautifully. But now using a program called Garrett and Instruments, you can link it in and do beautiful playback. And it is nice to hear the piece played back. Uh, but I don't play back while I'm writing. I can't do that. You get seduced. You hmm. get seduced by the immediacy of the music and you stop listening in your head and you stop hearing it in the conversation that it has to be. You know, it's it's like a novel. You have to constantly be reading what you wrote before and going with the flow of what you're writing. And if you keep stopping, if you keep stopping and having someone else read it out loud to you, I, I don't see how you have any continuity going on. So for me, the electronics are a lovely toy and a great way to notate clearly. I don't have to hire a copyist any longer to do that. But others will tell you that the computer for them is a is a wonderful tool, and uh, and bless them, they're writing music the likes of which I would not write, and probably wouldn't all that much respect music in which the continuum is uh, is a constant cut and paste overlay. You hear that kind of stuff all the time now. That doesn't do anything for me. I want to hear a story. I want to hear conflict. I want to hear resolution. I want to hear contrast. I want to hear thematic elements versus transitional elements versus developmental elements. I mm. want to hear what you have that makes this sound like a theme. I want to hear how you can develop that idea, the way characters on stage would develop their relationship as a drama proceeds. I mm. want you to tell me a story. I want there to be a beginning, a middle, and end. I want the music to have the same dramatic flow as a good book or a good play or a good song, a song with words, you know, because the words tell us the story. Yeah. So one must be very careful about the tools because the tools can take over. And that's, that's significant. You know, when it comes to songs, I, I mean, but look, you're writing a string quartet. Anyone can tell within five seconds if the composer knows what they're doing. Five seconds. Hmm. With a song, you can, it seems to me, as you said, you can fake it up to a certain degree. But the difference between a good song and a bad song, even if it's just a tiny increment, becomes almost instantly obvious by whether the, the words flow. Does the harmonic support intensify emotional meaning? Uh, is there any inner lines that, again, brings the upper line, the, the thematic stuff to the surface? You can always tell when something's been written by someone who knows what they're doing. I mean, you can always tell. I, I had this very nice guy. I, I hope he's not watching. She sent me... Well, he sent me this piece he wrote for chorus and piano. His wife wrote a poem. He said it. And he got in his mind, like every beginner does, that I've created a masterwork because he managed to get it on paper. You know, because something exists today that didn't exist last week, it must be special. Uh -huh. And that's how everyone feels about their earliest efforts. Look at this miracle I've just created. It didn't exist three weeks ago, and now it does, and it almost sounds like music. Well, that's a big deal. But if you ask me my opinion of it, I can't tell you what I think because there's nothing to tell you. All you can say is whether it shows promise or not because it's too easy to say what it's not. The key never changes. The melody is banal. Uh, there's no interplay of voices, so it's just one stiff chord moving to the next. 
I mean, it shows promise, but now you need 10 years of training to figure out what the hell you're doing and how you're going to do it. And then we'll know whether you have something to say. Yeah. So just be exactly the electronics are allowing people to create objects that because they exist, that's a good thing, but it doesn't make them good as competitively with others. And, uh, Boy, there's a lot. I mean, you just have to go on the web and this, everybody is putting stuff up now. Oh my goodness. When I'm up late at night and I can't go to sleep and, uh, and I, I want to torture myself or not. I just, it's really weird to see how much is out there. I wanted to, uh, with that said, I, I guess I'll throw this out. I'm going to get a lot of hate mail now. No, no, well, no, listen, know? first off, I want to say, I often get things thrown at me like, and I'm, you're better at this than I am. They'll say, hey, listen to my music. And I'm like, I'm going to be honest. And and then they say, you know, no, I want you to. And I'm like, your yeah, singing is flat. You know, there's the chord progression is, I hate to say banal, but you have to say if it is, right? Um, this is the beginning of something continue to work on it, continue right. to challenge yourself, you know, whatever. Uh, but it's hard. And, and you're asking for my opinion. I've got to find more of a Dr. Bergian approach to that where I'm like, wow, you really created something. And then just. <laughs> well, God, God bless you for creating something today that didn't exist yesterday. Right. Having said that, you know, we all have just so many breaths on our body and, and, you know, no matter how rich you are, you can't buy time. And if I'm going to spend a half hour of my time listening to your songs, no. No, I'm sorry. I could be I could be watching an episode of of uh, you know of something on television for God's sake. Um, I, 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 I Larry David, I'll get something back for my half hour. And that always becomes the issue when people ask ask you to listen to music or read a book. I always feel like it's a mugging when someone sends me a book. I know they mean it a well-meaning, especially an author, because I'm asked all the time to read stuff for blurbs. It, it, you're being mugged. How long does it take to read a book? Three, four days? Four hours a day? Excuse me, I'm not giving you that time. You might as well just ask me for $5,000, you know, because that's what my time's worth. It, duh. Yeah. It's, it's um, you know, that's the beauty of painting. It's a beauty of visual art, isn't it? You could look at it. And make an appraisal fairly quickly. That's but but you read a book or listen to a piece of music. Oh shit! You're it doesn't take my... fifteen hours to look at a painting. Right, you're taking my time, and uh, I don't have enough of it as it is. Let me go back to the thing I wanted to start earlier. I've been inspired by you, and you yourself have said you uh, you appreciate the break it down show. So hopefully this will land in the right way. But uh, here is in honor of my brother's passing and I've been meaning to do this for a long time, is uh, I'm going to do a series of six shows in the spirit of our friend Mozart. And then you, dearest friend, I'm quoting a little bit of his letter to Haydn. Um, they're going to be my gift to you. Our children from the Break It Down show, they'll be in honor of you. So two of them that are coming up is a guy named Vladimir Fung, which I think is an incredible name on the surface because <laughs> he's this American kid. He's 22. And he plays the cello like Johnny plays the uh, the violin. I mean, or I should say the fiddle, right? Because he's a fiddle player too. He he plays the violin and he plays this old music that is from 200 years ago, like you said, you know, three, three generations back. And it takes you away from where you're at, like, you know, cello and piano, whatever it is. And then he'll sit down and he's one of the best players in the world. And he's just a baby. He's 22. So we're going to do that. And then I got a guy named Larry Lowe, who's a pops conductor. And I, I'm just going to go through and I'm going to do six of these conversations in honor of you and what you've shown us and what you've taught us. And, and that's that's uh, that's how I want to, you know, one, keep my brother's memory alive, but also as a way of just saying, you're just so wonderful, Dr. Bob. And we just love the hell out of you. you. And I, we're just going to love the hell out of this experience. And, you know, we got cello and conductors we'll, we'll get a whole bunch of people so i'm going to shut up and let you and john talk no how how do you find these guys how do you find these people you know i i because of you in part i go to the uh the, the pacific symphony and because i'm a veteran i get these tickets for nothing i'm sitting in the front row and i spent 15 dollars and my girlfriend and i are sitting there you know mm -hmm. um and then we go to another show and there's Larry, and it's it's the pacific symphony so it's a place that people go to if there's a show you know show on the road i mean the the Jersey Boys guys came around for their holiday show that they do. There's all these incredible people. 
there's a guy in our orchestra, in the symphony, the lead violin player. He plays a Stradivarius. I mean, there's these people are just right here in front of me. By the way, in front of everybody else, too. Like, you are not that far from a symphony hall. Just go. There's um, a guy from my hometown. He, uh, he set up the pops in Macon, Georgia. So this can happen anywhere. And so how do I find these people? I just... Emmanuel Axe came to my hometown and played the piano. How could I not go and watch right, that? Right. You know, these guys are incredible. And, and what's also amazing to me is Emmanuel Axe, whoever it's going to be, sits down at the piano. Here's how many notes are in front of his face when he plays for 45 minutes to an hour and a half. Zero. And he's playing with this massive orchestra. And granted, the conductor's taking care of the orchestra part. But there is nothing, not a single note. This is concert grade music from inside his brain out to his fingers. Never a fluff, never an error, nothing. And uh, I just want to put these people on display again in honor of you and and do these six conversations. Sounds great. Sounds great. That uh, speaks to what you just said about you know these uh, folks who have these miles behind them to cultivate their art. I mean, you know any stand-up comedian will tell you it took me a year to make that material and it's because i've been doing it for 12 years that i'm good enough to to create an hour special by dragging this material back and forth around the country for a year just to find that you know economy of my delivery to make these things funny and you know the and the contrast to that like you were saying is these people who um, want to show you this piece of work that they created that doesn't have that kind of cultivation behind it. You know, music is one of those things, and and I've known this for a long time, especially since I started dealing with the public and and adults teaching adults. Most people, I I, I won't say every person, but but close to every person, has some sort of relationship with music. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are, what you are. You've got some sort of relationship with some music that means something important to you at some time of your life, at, at some point of your psyche. I don't care what that music is. It's what you grew up with. It's, it's what they were singing when you, when you had your first kiss, whatever. People have ownership of a lot of different kinds of music. And so it really doesn't matter if you're trained or not trained as a musician. Everyone has an opinion when it comes to music. And you have to remember that as a trained musician, especially as someone who would teach uh, other music to other people, that everyone in front of you has got a real valid opinion about somebody of music that I might not know anything about or that I might look down on. And I've got to be so careful not to do that. Hmm. But this is the thing about music. It's uh, everyone's got an opinion. And it's usually a good opinion in terms of their own life and their own experience. So you've got to be careful, right? With an amateur songwriter, an amateur composer, well, it still came from the heart, right? And, and it still means something powerful to them. And it still reflects their own experience, which is as worthy as my experience. So exactly, Pete, if someone comes to you with some songs, you know, it's, it's our time. And, and I might not want to spend the time, but we have to be careful too, because people's hearts get so wrapped up in their music in a way that maybe nothing else really does, you know, not even their politics, God bless us, in this horrific age of, of political confrontation. But music is just, it's a sacred thing in that way. So we got to be careful. I just, I, and I've learned that the hard way, not to be a jerk, you know. Not to, not to put anything down, because the moment you do that, you've made a terrible mistake. Yeah. Well, and anybody who wants to know about the terrible mistakes of Dr. Bob need only get, <laughs> go listen to his old episodes with us and, and find the prom oh, story. Yeah, the prom uh, story. There's that. The prom story, yes. Yeah. We'll, sa we'll, we'll save uh, somebody. Actually, we'll, somebody go back and listen to those if you want that. It's worth the listen. Uh, I also want to um, bring up that I recently saw uh, who I consider the greatest living piano player, Herbie Hancock. Um, I, we've encountered him a couple of times in the last couple of years or so. And uh, last time I saw him in Napa and as I watched his band and I watched what he was able to create, 
I thought to myself, you know, Dr. Bob was once a composition teacher to Tony Williams. You're my third degree separation from Herbie there Hancock. You there you go. Uh, Pete, while you're one of you guys, look up a, uh, there's a duet. Herbie Hancock and Chick Corea toured as a duet for a while. Uh -huh. And they did a concert in Japan. And part of that concert was recorded. They do a duet on George Gershwin's, uh, and Ira Gershwin's song, Eliza, L-I-Z-A. If you could put up a link to the folks who are watching uh, of, of Hancock and Korea playing Liza, it's it's a small miracle what they do. They they cross every stylistic bound in that. I mean, from from swing to to almost Bartokian kind of twentieth century pianism, and this back and forth dialogue they have via improvisation, it is it's stunning, absolutely stunning. Everybody, if if they don't put up a link, uh, Liza, Chickaria, Herbie Hancock duet. It'll blow you away. Wow. The um, the time prior to that, that uh, we actually got to meet uh, Herbie, if only for a moment, um, was at the uh, Tech Awards. And the they were honoring uh, the Hall of Fame award that year was Joni Mitchell. Mm. And of course, Joni is, um, you know, she's still with us um, and she's hanging in there. But the presenter of that award was Herbie and they brought him up and he started to have a hard time with the teleprompter. And then he just thought, you know, he had some prepared remarks and he had just begun them. Uh, and then he just kind of waved away the teleprompter right. and he talked right to Joni and he said, it all started with, and he just went through her entire discography and record by record by record. He talked about specifically what that piece of work meant to him at that time in his life. And he had such an intimate knowledge of her entire body of work. There was not a dry eye in the house. And, and we were all blown away uh, at his encyclopedic knowledge of every, you know, every recording that she had made. And by the way, you, you shouldn't be too blown away by that because, you know, they worked together extensively. Yeah. Yeah. In 78, you know, when Charlie Mingus was was on his last legs, mm -hmm. she made an album with Mingus. Yeah. And and on that recording was, uh, among others, was uh, what uh, Wayne Shorter on saxophone mm -hmm. and Herbie Hancock on piano. And she was a she was a total jazz freak. And then Don Juan's daughter, that album, a lot of jazz influence in her work. Yeah. And if you if you read these interviews with her, you'll read that the music she was listening to most in high school was Lambert Hendricks and Ross, this, this close harmony singing group from the late fifties and early 1960s and that she knew all the songs on these albums and blah, blah. I, you know, you know why this is in the front of my mind? Cause Dr. Bob prescribes in a week and a half is about Lambert Hendricks and Ross or maybe <laughs> no, it was just the other day. It was on Tuesday. And I finished it with a quote by Joni Mitchell. Uh. She is uh, she's one of those pan musical people who drew inspiration from, from it would seem, almost Everything. every genre. And that's what we were talking about before. You know, your library, what's the library you've got in your head? Yeah. She had a library of all kinds of music in her head, which is why she was able to make such good choices because she knew all the stuff that was out there. But I'm not surprised that A, Herbie Hancock was asked to do the talk and that B, he knew her work because they, they've been tight for for you know many decades. over 40 years yeah. yeah yeah well if you want to increase your body of knowledge for, our, for you know for music throughout the years throughout the centuries even um then go to doc uh, go to robertgreenbergmusic.com and uh check out what's there and then join dr bob's patreon and uh, become a patron and join that um elite community at this point too elite. Let it be less elite. Yeah. Let it be. Let it be Oakland Coliseum unelite. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we love you, Doctor Bob. Thank love you, so you guys much too. For being with us. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is so great. All right, everybody, stand by one sec here. I'll shut this thing down.
Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to, curated by yours truly. Thank you so much for watching the